Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webcast. My name is Gregory Frelov. I'm a vice president of Free Russia Foundation. Today, we present the second issue of the uh, Kremlin Influence Quarterly. That's our great journal where we cover uh, different malign activities of Kremlin and his affiliates uh, in European Union, plus Great Britain in uh, countries of European Partnership and Western Balkans. This time we cover such countries as uh, Poland, uh, North Macedonia, Ukraine. Uh, we have a piece on Estonia. Uh, we have a piece on France, actually, very important piece. Uh, the whole project uh, of the Kremlin uh, Influence Quarterly is dedicated uh, to cover different kind of malign activities in different fields, uh, like politics, uh, economy, uh, the energy security, religion, diplomacy, uh, and that's how we put all the content of the journal. You can check it out because the journal is already uh, out there on our website, uh, forfreerussia.org. Uh, and today we have uh, a floor of great speakers, and uh, I'm now moving this to Michael Weiss, the uh, director of special investigations, so with our Free Russia Foundation who will be a moderator for this event. The event will take one hour. Uh, everyone is welcome to uh, ask questions uh, and uh, put some statements uh, on, uh, on this in text format on the live translation on YouTube. So please do this. And I think uh, it's enough for me for today. And uh, Michael, can you please take the floor and introduce our, uh, our speakers for today? Sure. Thank you, Greg. Um, so we have a very um, accomplished panel for today's discussion. Uh, and I, without further ado, I want to introduce them so that they can get to their very important presentations. And just a, a, a note on housekeeping. Um, if you have a question at any point, you can submit it into the question chat window to your right. Uh, I prefer them to be written out so that I can sort of read them and curate them and ask them at the appropriate time of, of the uh, relevant panelists rather than uh, any other way of, of submitting them. So just FYI. Um, our first speaker, Anton Shakovsov, is a senior fellow at the Free Russia Foundation. He's also an external lecturer at the University of Vienna and an expert at the European Platform for Democratic Elections in Germany. Uh, our second panelist will be Melissa Hooper, a lawyer, a rule of law expert, and the director of Human Rights and Civil Society Program at Human Rights First. Finally, Anastasia Kirilenko, a uh, Russian freelance journalist based in Paris, the co-producer of the documentary Putin and the Mafia, editor of the Transborder Corruption Archive database under the umbrella of EU-Russia Civil Society Forum. Uh, so Anton, we're going to begin with you, followed by Melissa and then Anastasia. Yeah, hello, Michael. Hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to introduce already the second issue of um, our journal, The Kremlin's Influence Quarterly. Uh, we started the project last year in December, but uh, with uh, different organizing uh, activities, we uh, published the first issue uh, this spring, so it's the time for the second issue. And we have uh, eight chapters uh, in, this, um, in this issue. Uh, as Greg mentioned, they covered uh, several countries and particular areas. And I want just to give you a short uh, overview of, of the contents of, the, of this issue. Um, some of the chapters actually build on the previous, uh, previous cases, previous uh, pieces that we published before. Uh, I, for example, myself, I um, continue looking at how the Kremlin uh, uses uh, the COVID-19 pandemic in order to advance its uh, malign influence uh, in Europe. Uh, the first issue had my piece on uh, the case of Italy, and this time I will uh, I um, I explored uh, the case of Serbia. But I will talk about this a bit later. Another piece that uh, continues what was started already in the first issue is the chapter by uh, Martin Malik, uh, an Austrian political scientist. And he continues looking at the Austrian-Russian business relations and how they are being instrumentalized by the Kremlin in order to exert influence uh, in Austria. Uh, two uh, Moldovan colleagues, Sergei Tofilat and Viktor Palikov, uh, 
explore how uh, Russia uses uh, gas supplies in order to wield uh, malign influence in Moldova, and especially how these, how the revenues from gas supplies are being used in order to support separatism in Moldova. And uh, here we, of course, uh, uh, talk about uh, Transnistria, um, a republic which is not recognized internationally, which is in, uh, in the within the international borders of of Moldova, but is used by the Kremlin to to have to 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 still maintain somehow Moldova in the Russian sphere of influence. Uh, Georgi Chuzhov, our colleague from the Free Russia Foundation based in Kyiv, is uh, traditionally looking at Ukraine. And uh, for this, uh, for this uh, issue, he was looking at how uh, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate uh, is being used by Moscow in order to uh, exert influence uh, on the Ukrainian society. And uh, many of the many in the audience, I think, will know that um, Ukraine acquired autonomous, acquired uh, the um, autonomy for the Ukrainian uh, Orthodox Church. But at the same time, Moscow maintains this influence in the religious sphere of, of Ukraine, and it is in particular through the working of this uh, Moscow Patriarchate uh, that uh, that the Kremlin is. Uh, trying to also keep Ukraine in the Russian sphere of influence, despite uh, the uh, despite the the ongoing war uh, that Russia wages uh, against uh, Ukraine. Alexandra Yatsik, who is uh, who has recently become a fellow of the Free Russia Foundation, looks at the um, Russian government's agents of influence in Estonia. Uh, the period of interest is, of course, uh, since 2014. Uh, this is the year when Russia annexed Crimea and started the war in eastern Ukraine, and that was the moment of uh, dramatic deterioration uh, of the relations between Russia and the West. So this, I think, um, explains why, why uh, uh, this period was taken for consideration in the case of Estonia. And she identifies uh, three clusters of uh, agents of Russian influence in Estonia. One group is the Russian state institutions and Estonian institutions or structures supported by the Russian government. The second group uh, is uh, local activists uh, who um, criticize or tend to criticize Estonia uh, for alleged violations of the principles of liberal democracy. And the third group is the local agents who spread pro-Russian and anti-Estonian messages uh, in, the, in the mass media. Um, Alisa Volkova, another fellow of the Free Russia Foundation, uh, analyzes how Russia-affiliated forces are trying, not always successfully, to influence public opinion and politics in North Macedonia, um, the country that, uh, due to uh, the dispute around its name, uh, was somehow kept aside or kept um, outside of the of the European uh, European Union. And also NATO, but the uh, the situation now has um, has improved because of the consensus of the of the new name of the country, North Macedonia. But still, Russia, although obviously uh, because of the because of the change in the name and because of the consensus, now North Macedonia is 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 taking this path towards uh, Western institutions. But Russia is trying to do something about it. But as Alisa Volkova shows, not necessarily su successfully. Uh, we also have uh, two chapters by the uh, participants of uh, today's presentation. Um, uh, Melissa Hooper, who will uh, talk about her own contribution on Poland, and uh, Anastasia Kirilenko uh, with her chapter on France. So I will uh, at the moment stop uh, uh, here and. Uh, would later also comment on my own contribution on Serbia. Okay, thank you very much, Anton. Uh, Melissa, I turn it over to you now. Great, thank you, Michael. 
Um, so I um, authored a chapter on Poland for this quarterly. And what is interesting, I think, about this chapter is that when we began to examine what is happening in Poland, um, you would not you would not think to to talk about what the Kremlin is doing in Poland as um, very effective in terms of its influence. However, what we are seeing is that there are strategies being used within Poland that look very similar to what you might see the Kremlin do in other countries. Um, it's just not that the Kremlin is authoring most of those strategies. Um, they seem to be authored by the current Polish government. And so I wanted to take a look at how what the current Polish government is doing does seem to emulate what you see the Kremlin do in other countries. And my uh, my conclusion or or the point that I wanted to drive home is that we are seeing governments adopt some of these strategies and weaken their own institutions in ways that the Kremlin has done. Um, so for example, when we speak about Russian influence in Europe, we talk about things like use of disinformation, um, the weakening or distrust of institutions and processes, um, the use of uh, conspiracy theories as part of the disinformation or historical revisionism, as well as support to far right parties or the use of traditional values messaging. Anton mentioned um, that the Kremlin uses the Orthodox Church um, to so influence in places like Georgia and Ukraine. Um, we are seeing those strategies used by governments, and that includes the, the Polish government, the law and justice government that came to power in 2015. Um, and unfortunately, the, even though this is not Russia that is doing most of the um, sowing of division or exacerbating of um, existing polarizations, the, the results are definitely the same. Um, we're seeing that the actions of the Polish government are driving a wedge between itself and its allies, and that includes the Poland and the EU, but it also includes Poland and its support for Ukraine in Ukraine's um, attempts to uh, move away from or, or deal with a Russian um, invasion. We also see uh, exploitation of uh, polarization, the weakening of institutions, including the judiciary and free media. Um, and what happens there is that we see a greater distrust of these institutions by the Polish population. And that's happening because of what the Polish government seems to be doing now. Um, and then we also see um, a lack of ability to work with within the transatlantic relationship to maintain uh, democratic institutions and that includes or, or democratic uh, strengthening such as anti-corruption measures um, or combating disinformation because if you have the the government itself doing these things it's quite difficult to then um, combat them so I'm going to talk about, I'll just describe a few specific ways we're seeing this develop in Poland and how that what we're seeing in Poland is similar to what we might see the Kremlin do. Um, I think that the main focus of concern in Poland has to do with the Polish government's weakening of its own institutions. Um, and that loses what makes them democratic, their strength, their the trust in them from the population. We've seen this in the attacks on the judiciary. Um, there has been a, a series of laws that have been instituted that have pushed out judges that have used illegal processes to appoint judges um, and the creation of an extraordinary appeal body that is a political body that can rehear judicial cases um, and now we see the disciplining or the firing of judges if their written opinions, so if their judicial opinions are deemed by the Ministry of Justice to be improper by the government. So essentially, if the government disagrees with what judges are doing, they can be fired. Um, the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe described what's happening to Poland's judiciary as a Soviet-style system now, um, which... I, which harkens you know, back to an old system, but again, is looking more toward what we've seen in former Russian systems. Um, interestingly, we've also seen these loyalty tests used for media regulatory bodies, and we've also seen NGO audits 
or what you might call raids, um, similar to what we saw in Russia in 2013, in order to um, identify NGOs as a uh, agent of foreign influence, perhaps, um, or as in entities that are accepting, quote, foreign funding. The interesting note here is that when uh, Russia has used the, the specter of foreign funding, it is deemed as a problematic funding because it's coming from the West, whereas in Poland, we're actually talking about EU funding. Um, and so that uh, leads into the second vector, which is polarization. Um, when the Polish government identifies the EU as a source of um, concern or as a threat, it is driving a great deal of polarization within the, the Polish electorate and the Polish people. Um, there are those that are very pro-EU, um, and you saw this in the last presidential election, uh, where you had a, an, a candidate that really wanted to lift up EU values and use that as part of his messaging, um, versus the, the current peace government, which has tried to um, lift up uh, the specter of foreign influence, stating that um, the, the EU is a occupying force and um, stating that the, the presidential candidate that was running on a pro-EU platform was, had shadowy foreign influences behind him. Um, and so when we see this anti-EU messaging um, being brought up, we are, we're seeing a, a driving force to pull Poland apart. This includes anti-migration messaging, you know, Kaczynski's remarks that um, migrants bring parasites and protozoa and that the EU is occupying Poland by urging Poland to accept um, migrants. Um, you also see a lot of disinformation that has been aimed at the EU, unfortunately, um, in Poland. The Oxford Internet Institute showed that ahead of the European parliamentary election last year in 2019, that polls actually shared more junk news than real news on social media ahead of the election. So Poland is not doing an excellent job of combating disinformation, is actually um, seems to be implementing more disinformation itself. And you, you do have um, the use of internet trolling groups um, that have been identified by the Computational Propaganda Institute at, at Oxford within Poland. So you have the government, but also uh, regular political entities using troll farms to put out disinformation. So rather than trying to create its own resilience, Poland has decided, the Polish government has decided that it wants to just continue using this strategy and use it against itself. Um, one major force of disinformation within Poland is of course the Smolensk strategy, uh, Smolensk um, tragedy and the use of that to again, drive polarization. Um, Globesec showed this year that Kaczynski and Pisch have convinced almost a quarter of the Polish population that the Smolensk crash was staged and that former Prime Minister Donald Tusk made a deal with Russia to kill the former president of Poland. Um, this is a, an outlandish strategy. It counter contradicts both Russian and Polish investigations that have been conducted, but the repetition of this disinformation um, has taken root. Um, so we're seeing some, some dangerous uh, belief in disinformation and very, that creates a very difficult environment for um, creating resilience. Similarly, you see historical revisionism used by the government um, that has created a new uh, task force to investigate, quote, crimes of Ukrainian nationalists um, in 2018. This is problematic because Poland has been the major source of support for Ukraine as Ukraine um, combats the invasion by Russia. And so driving its own division uh, with Ukraine is difficult. It creates problems within the EU. It also creates problems for the Poland-Ukraine relationship. And there doesn't seem to be any benefit that the Polish government or the Polish people are getting from this, the, the focus on this on this new, you know, anti-Ukrainian um, strategy, it seems like the the entity or the government that's most likely to benefit is actually Russia. Um, similar to uh, what we've seen in 
Russia with the use of the church and the use of anti-LGBT messaging in particular, uh, you see a lot of traditional values messaging now in Poland. And um, what's interesting is that it seems to follow precisely the line that it has followed in Russia. Um, where there is a citation of a quote, gay ropa, that is uh, the land that the EU has created where equality is available. And that is seen as problematic because it threatens the religious um, communities that are within Russia or within Poland. Um, so what's interesting here is that, again, we're seeing the Polish government and communities within Poland affiliated with the government pushing this, but it is an anti-EU messaging. And so that is, again, sh Poland shooting itself in the foot as Poland is one of the um, economic greatest economic beneficiaries of European funding. It is still um, putting out anti-EU messaging and identifying the EU as a threat um, and as an entity that pushes foreign ideologies within uh, within the, the Polish community. Um, you see that the similar to Russia, that the church itself has been politicized and is then part of the government. Um, so that the Polish Catholic bishops are backing legislation that is put forth by the government, such as anti-abortion legislation in Poland, similar to the way Patriarch Kirill has spoken at the UN um, about uh, Russia's push for family values, um, its problems with same-sex marriage and domestic violence. Um, and incidentally, domestic violence has been on the agendas of both governments with Poland withdrawing from the Istanbul Convention, similar to, way, to the way Russia decriminalized domestic violence in 2017. Um, and leading you know, straight from traditional values and anti-LGBT messaging, you do see a creation of space for the far right to be part of the the governing community in Poland. Um, so whereas Russia would be supporting far right parties in Europe and in maybe you know in the past in Poland in order to drive division and and dissension, um, the Polish government is courting the far right in order to get votes. Um, but in order to do this, uh, they have created a situation where there is greater hate. There is a, a higher um, incidents of hate crimes. And you have, uh, for example, a surge in far-right rallies with anti-migrant messaging um, that the government is calling a beautiful sight or a uh, stirring patriotism. Um, and so that they are allowing this, uh, this increased division to be created within the government. So, you know, my point, if I'd had more space, I might have referenced the fact that this is, of course, going beyond Poland. I'm speaking from the United States, and I do not miss the parallels that I see between uh, what's happening, you know, some of the strategies that the Polish government is using and even strategies that I see my own government using. Um, I think this broader phenomenon points to the fact that there are, the Kremlin has been able to use strategies in order to weaken democracies, but that those strategies are now being picked up by governments that want to use them to gain power or to maintain power. And those governments uh, seem to be less concerned about the fact that their institutions will weaken as a result. In Poland, from the same Globe study that I referenced earlier, um, Currently, poll as of June to 2020, polls 33% of polls, so a third of polls, do not believe mainstream media. They don't trust it, um, and that's the highest in Europe. And I, that is a result, I think, directly of the fact that you see an increase in um, government misuse of media, greater use of disinformation, um, and you're seeing that resulting weakening of institutions. So I'm hoping that. Uh, the discussions that we're seeing right now within um, within the U.S. about whether we need to be using resilience in order to combat Russian influence, or we need to be focusing on Russia. I hope we can use both, um, for example, and and note that resilience and um, the need to shore up our own institutions is really a way of combating Russian interference. Thank you. Great, thanks, Melissa. Um, Anastasia, your presentation, please. 
Um, uh, thank you, Michael. So before running uh, the presentation on RT France, it's uh, Kremlin voice uh, on French. Um, let's say uh, it was my focus because uh, the topic of Russian influence uh, in France is actually broad. Um, as you know, the president Emmanuel Macron um, announced a kind of reset with Putin. Uh, we have uh, pro-Russian uh, politicians who, um, for example, uh, travel regularly to Crimea to, and uh, they spread a message on Fr uh, French, uh, even mainstream media, that uh, the democracy is perfect in Russia. Uh, the all Russian vote to amend the constitution recently uh, uh, was um, remarkable, etc. Uh, so my f uh, focus is narrow. Uh, only on uh, Earth de France uh, channel, it was launched in 2017 and already it became visible, um, it became an important player in journalism in France, as I will show uh, on the presentation. So, um, RT, uh, Earth de France, uh, they uh, did a real headhunting. Uh, mainstream presenters uh, who were retired, or uh, they passed to um, Air de France uh, with, uh, of, of course, their contacts, their credibility, etc. Uh, I didn't put here a picture uh, of, uh, and uh, so um, I put here three examples, but there is more recent one. Uh, a high rank official from French intelligence became an anchor uh, on um, Russia Today French. So, and uh, he's spreading exactly uh, the uh, anti EU message, uh, anti US, uh, etc. Um, it's also, uh, my article is also about Sputnik Ag Agency, and this is the same holding with Russia Today. Um, and so practic practically, they contributed even to a knife attack on a mask uh, in France, because they spread a, a so-called random photo of uh, not uh, native French people smiling uh, in front of uh, burning Notre Dame de, de Paris. Uh, of course, the picture, uh, uh, those people, uh, they had nothing to do uh, to, to the fire. Uh, officially, it's not an arson, it was an accident. But uh, um, RT fr uh, France and also Sputnik insisted very much uh, on this anti Muslim. Uh, feeling anti-Muslim, you know, conspiracy. It is difficult to evalu evaluate uh, the outreach, but in this particular case, as I said, there was a knife attack on the mask after uh, this campaign, uh, and uh, the man uh, who perpetrated it, he said it was um, a revenge uh, because Muslims uh, made an uh, arson uh, on Notre Dame, so it became serious. Um, also, you know, in France we have anti-government Yellow West protests, and uh, surprisingly, um, Russia Today French is covering it uh, <laughs> five times uh, more actively than uh, all uh, French uh, mainstream media. Um, so in my articles, of course, their figures, uh, links, everything. Uh, so we can see on the picture, uh, sorry, now it's full screen. We can see on the picture that uh, Yellow West, uh, they propose to everybody to uh, watch on, on RT France and not the mainstream media uh, who uh, they, they call uh, clowns of uh, disinformation and, and only uh, on Russian me uh, media we can we can find uh, true information um, and mm, I didn't put it on my presentation probably I'll explain it here uh, in RT France is really uh, trying uh, to um, 
to enhance, uh, of course, divisions in French society and also enhance anti-American feelings and put uh, the West in war with itself. Um, so sometimes uh, we have even uh, comic examples uh, like a message that the Americans stole uh, masks uh, and uh, coronavirus, uh, the masks uh, were ordered by, by the French, but the Americans stole them. This is the news recently um, reported by Air de France, for, for example. Sometimes this is like, uh, I put the quotations because uh, uh, when they speak about journalism, they pretend to be journalists or also they, uh, they have <laughs> to put quotations. So uh, they uh, said during one show that uh, the US is like the Fourth Reich, uh, like the Nazis. Um, uh, so this, uh, this is, of course, my line uh, because uh, the French naturally, they already have uh, th those feelings that we should be independent uh, from uh, the US. And uh, on mainstream me media, often we can see even comparisons between Russia and US, not by all the sp speakers, but uh, uh, by some of them. So, um, yeah. Uh, uh, RT France uh, received the first reprimand as for uh, disinformation in French. In, in France, fortunately, we, we have a state uh, regulator like Ofcom in UK. Um, so they um, um, said that uh, RT France even faked vo uh, voiceovers for interviews to say that uh, in Syria there were uh, only stage chemical attacks, and they insist very much on this. Um, yeah, I also tried to look what is the, their hit, and so far, uh, this is a report. Um, it's already more views uh, than than I put. Uh, it should be close to one million. That in fact we have a tyranny in France. Uh, of course, we have uh, not only a Russian uh, conspiracy on that perspective, uh, but uh, Russian media tried to exploit it. <laughs> that, as you can see from the quotation, um, like Soviet Union, okay, it was bad, but we have also dead people because of capitalism or because of cancer. So the, the tyranny is, is there. And this is the hit. Um, this is some recurrent narratives uh, about Russia. They actually say uh, to, uh, they say uh, to mention Russia as seldom as possible. Their mainstream message is it's against the French government, against EU, against um, um, yeah, the US. Uh, only uh, like messages that uh, no proof that Russia um, interfered in the elections uh, somewhere. So when <laughs> when it's needed to to mention Russia, in that context, it's possible. It led to some comical situation when uh, yellow protest uh, yellow West uh, protesters were in live coverage by RT France, and th they said that <laughs> we need. Putin in in France, because uh, Russia is so good and pension, uh, pensioners in Russia uh, live so well, etc. Um, so now it's like uh, it's uh, it's like a joke. It looks like a joke, but uh, long term perspective, uh, you know, we should be worried uh, because of such messages, outreach. Yeah, this is uh, to say that they are, uh, to repeat probably that they are always anti-EU. What is worrying, uh, there's an example, uh, French youth, um, young bloggers were invited to uh, to do a, to visit EU premises. They accepted, but straight away uh, they uh, went on uh, Russia Today France to denounce EU. This is, uh, I also in France, I participated uh, in several events with French youth, and uh, I can say a feeling that this is a serious problem. Uh, they want, want to be an anti system, anti capitalism, and so they are in, 
more receptive for Russian propaganda than the elder generation. Yeah, so uh, the most one of the most expensive lawyers of uh, France is working for Russia today, and um, um, they announced uh, so far at least seven lawsuits against. Uh, uh, French media. Uh, I would say the French mainstream media don't uh, criticize them too much. Some of them uh, even say that there is no false information. Uh, they don't mention this reprimand from French regulator. There's an, an effect uh, which I compared to Fox News uh, versus Obama. When Obama, more than t 10 years ago, and his team, they were saying something like uh, Fox News is a talk radio, uh, like a talk radio. Immediately, uh, US journalists started to, to defend uh, Fox News. And this is um, something s uh, similar is happening in France. Emmanuel Macron, uh, who was uh, apparently hacked by Russia in 2017, I put also all, all the details well uh, in sh shortly because it's it was not the main topic in, in my article. So Emmanuel uh, Macron, uh, three years ago, he attacked uh, uh, Russia Today and Sputnik uh, uh, in during his meeting with Putin, and immediately French journalistic society started to defend them on the name of freedom of speech. Uh, so the, the situation uh, is uh, uh, really curious. <laughs> they uh, announce lawsuits against everybody who, who says uh, they, they put uh, any false information. Um, probably the last uh, thing to uh, emphasize, uh, of course, they um, um, they are not directly uh, pro far right uh, and pro Marine Le Pen, uh, but uh, they transmit uh, their messages as they um, put in an example. Uh, they try to enhance the hate speech. Um, there are um, also another examples, uh, and uh, this is dangerous. Last news uh, we have on far right in France. Um, in, uh, the ser uh, servers of um, investigators who investigated the uh, state investigators so from the prosecution who were looking into financement of national rally of uh, it was uh, front national before they were hacked it happened like uh, yesterday <laughs> um one uh, person from this national rally uh, is convicted because he was burning cars the, himself uh, to attribute it to migrants and to uh, to win uh, local elections. So in that context, uh, when every provocations are possible, uh, of course uh, we should be concerned. Michael, great, thank you, Anastasia. Um, so. One thing, I, I just have some sort of remarks and observations and questions myself, um, given the three panelists. So, you know, Melissa, you talked about Poland sort of, it's, it's a weird kind of paradoxical situation because you have the, the Polish state and, and sort of uh, institutions which have become para-state apparatuses, including the media, right? Um, peddling these lines, which are superficially, let us say, anti-Kremlin. Um, or hostile to Russia, such as the conspiracy theory about Poland's Air Force One, which people would, you know, automatically assume, well, gee, you know, that dastardly Vladimir Putin killed, you know, our political class in this kind of operation. And yet you make the very salient point that a lot of the tropes and styles and sort of, you know, the particularly when that is welded to uh, Eurosceptic or anti-EU agenda, actually end up serving Moscow's interest in a bizarre way. And, you know, for instance, we're seeing a lot of this play out right now in Belarus, or we did prior to the election when Lukashenko famously arrested the 30 plus Wagner mercenaries and then tried to portray the opposition as hirelings of Moscow. And now, I mean, you know, witness the post-election dynamics where RT uh, employees are coming into Belarus to take the positions vacated by boycotted or boycotting state 
media representatives and Lukashenko is being sort of embraced by uh, Margarita Simignon, the RT editor in chief, while riot police are rounding up mostly women activists. I wonder if, if and, and this is a question I would open up to all of you, if you can talk about this kind of weird interplay between again, a sort of uh, surface level anti-Kremlin or Russia hostile messaging, which in fact, when you dig down a little deeper, really just ends up kind of playing into Russia's foreign policy interests of dividing the West, you know, against itself and trying to kind of cleave countries away from supranational institutions that were meant to kind of draw them all together in this cohesive block. So Melissa, I mean, I'll turn it to you because you dealt with Poland and that's sort of what rung these bells for me. Yeah, I would just point out exactly that um, the use of disinformation or the use of, you know, this divisive rhetoric, the fact that it might be targeted toward the Kremlin one day and then toward the EU the next, it's always going to decrease the level of trust in discourse, the level of trust in the government that might be putting out this information. The the fact that the target may vary and that it sometimes may be targeted at a government that is more and I don't know a you know a hostile government isn't helpful. Um, the fact of the use of the disinformation, the historical revisionism, um, the conspiracy theories that in itself is uh, destructive to the democratic space, and that's where we need to focus our attention. Anton, I know you've you've dealt a lot with, uh, or you've been very interested in the whole Belarusian scenario. Can you talk a little bit about this? I mean, you know, the use of Prigozhin to meddle in foreign countries, particularly in democratic elections, from Mozambique to uh, South Africa. We, you know, you've done done a lot of reporting and, and work and scholarship on the Africa situation, but also the use of Prigozhin as this kind of universal donor of paranoia or a kind of bugbear that can be exploited even by pro-Kremlin interests in Europe. Uh, talk a little bit about your own research into how, you know, seemingly, I mean, in, in the case of Prigozhin and Wagner, I mean, these are essentially tools of the Russian Defense Ministry and the GRU, and yet they've, they've been instrumentalized by allies of those two institutions. Um, what have you found? Let me let me yeah. um, first follow up on something that um, uh, Melissa said. Uh, you see, apart from apart from um, the Kremlin's direct influence, uh, when we see that Russia, Putin's Russia, is attempting to do particular particular efforts uh, in order to advance its own political interests. Also, there is an indirect, uh, indirect, and sometimes even unconscious uh, uh, development that that is being produced. Is the is that Russia uh, gives particular models to to leaders to 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 um, to sometimes authoritarian leaders, sometimes uh, populist leaders. It gives them different blueprints. For I would say, well, in in, in uh, people who study Russia know the the term political technology, you know, spin doctoring essentially. But uh, um, for example, Viktor Orban, uh, he is of course portrayed as a, as an ally of of Putin's Russia uh, for many reasons. I do believe, however, that Orban is mostly following his own interests. But at the same time, we we can see. Uh, similar to the the Polish case that Melissa talked about, how Orban um, is how, how he is learning lessons from Putin's Russia. Uh, for example, uh, Russia had this uh, infamous um, foreign foreign agent law. Uh, Hungary introduced something very uh, very similar. Then we see that in Russia they almost closed down the European University. Uh, for political reasons, because the European uni University was uh, famous for for promoting progressive agenda, and then Hungary, Orbán's Hungary, is driving away the Central European University from Budapest to Vienna. So we see how these particular uh, particular lessons are being learned by populist leaders. So it's indirect influence. Also, uh, there is another interesting thing, and this is where Prigozhin comes in. Russia is also 
um, uh, offering, even sometimes, you know, selling a product of uh, different types of political technology. And one, one, one particular type that is Russia is trying to sell uh, everywhere, um, not only in, uh, in the post-Soviet space, uh, but also sometimes in Asia and now in Africa, this is biased uh, electoral observation uh, or fake electoral observation. Uh, which is important for many regimes that are trying to somehow maybe uh, steal the elections or conduct fraudulent elections, and they need international legitimization of those fraudulent elections. And Prigozhin, he created his 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 back office in St. Petersburg, created such a um, such a structure uh, called Afrik. The Association for the uh, researchers of uh, allegedly researchers of, of African political sciences. That is uh, that's a structure that Prigozhin's people are using in order to support particular politicians in in African countries, in Madagascar, in South uh, South Africa, Central Africa, um, uh, Mozambique, in order uh, to 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 push particular to push particular. Um, politicians that could be useful for Prigozhin and also for uh, the Russian interests, and this is the, the the typical the typical political technology invention of uh, of the Russian Federation. Uh, but now it's also somehow outsourced uh, to Prigozhin, and of course his interests are quite wide. Um, mm. On the, on the one hand, he he's providing this paramilitary force. Um, in in the form of the Wagner uh, Wagner people, uh, the Wagner group. Uh, but at the same time, there are you know political technologists, spin doctors who are working for him. Uh, different uh, consultancies that are um, sometimes quite unsuccessfully actually uh, trying to promote uh, Prigozhin's own interests in Africa. But sometimes they are uh, successful. But this is the product that they created. So we are talking also about the Russian influence. In terms of uh, of creating or you know exporting particular uh, illiberal or uh, better probably to say you know this cynical um, um, models or 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 tricks how to how to um, steal elections or how to uh, give legitimacy to to political fraud. Uh, and that's uh, that's a very interesting uh, development to to um, to investigate. Mm. Yeah, and I I had a report with Pierre Bao in the Daily Beast showing that the the delegates, quote unquote, that Afrique is using to monitor and to interfere in these elections include neo Nazis and white supremacists, all who are meant to be pushing an anti colonialist, pan Africanist agenda in these countries. So they go and they certify the Zimbabwe election for the ruling party and then come back and write for their far right blogs, Zimbabwe is a racist one party state. So here again, you see this kind of bizarre contradiction at play, right? The political interests, I guess, and this is sort of a result of the, the collapse of Soviet ideology as kind of the guiding force of Russian foreign policy. Everything is sort of this kind of cocktail or hodgepodge and you can take on Monday, you know, European neo-Nazis on Tuesday, neo-Stalinists on, on Wednesday kind of, you know, libertarian idealists, throw them all together and just kind of mix things up in that way. And, and sometimes, indeed, I mean, as we were saying earlier, uh, the outward appearance of it could even be used as a kind of anti-Moscow uh, sort of sovereign nationalist um, posturing. But at the end of the day, when you have countries at war with each other internally within the European continent or the transatlantic relationship, um, it does end up serving in the long term Kremlin interests. Anastasia, I want to ask you something about France. Uh, just today, before we, we had this uh, panel discussion, I saw a headline, I think it was uh, France Vinquet, uh, that um, the Navalny poisoning has now derailed Macron's attempt at a reset with Russia or attempts to court Putin. So you, you mentioned, uh, and, and we all remember this, you know, that, that seemingly stalwart moment where Macron was denouncing RT in the day, on the podium next to Putin for you know, trafficking in all kinds of disinformation. And there was a hack and leak operation for in March before the election. Uh, there was all kinds of homophobic insinuations about Macron himself. And then, you know, lo and behold, sometime after 
the Turkish invasion of Northeast Syria and Macron's famous comments about the brain death, quote unquote, of NATO. This sort of gradual rapprochement attempt. Um, France must be a partner with Russia on counterterrorism. You know, the, uh, the United States is sort of absent and Europe must take its destiny and into its own hands. And yet, for all that, and for all this sort of kind of period of good feeling, shall we say, between Paris and Moscow, zero dividends at the level of policy. And now this Navalny poisoning, which Germany and France seem to be aligned on and quite forcefully pushing back and saying this was a state act of terrorism using Novichok. Talk a little bit about how you see the future of Russian or pro-Kremlin disinformation efforts in France playing out now. I mean, if, if, if there really is a kind of nail driven into the coffin of a French Russian reset, what do you see things looking like? Is it going to go back to attacking Macron, trying to stir up uh, civil discord uh, with the Yellow Jackets and so on and so forth, um, embracing the pen and the far right and also the far left? Um, well, first, uh, you know, they're flexible. Uh, recently, Macron uh, defended Poland as for World War II, because, as you remember, Russia accused Poland, Russian propaganda, and Putin himself, yeah, accused uh, Poland of being... Um, uh, reason or of uh, the beginning of World War Two, and also the country who actually started it. <laughs> so Macron some uh, defended Poland, and several days after Russian state uh, TV, not in French but in Russian language, like Kisilov, uh, Vesti, etc., uh, they uh, did anti-French program. It was uh, during uh, this so-called reset. Um, so this is amazing uh, how, well, how they are flexible, uh, let, let's say. Another example of flexibility uh, during uh, the EU uh, election, so elections to European Parliament, uh, are, uh, Russia Today French, uh, they they wanted to harm two uh, pro-Macron candidates, uh, who is the main rival of Marine Le Pen from National Rally. So they put everything uh, together. They said she was um, too pro-Muslim and too homophobic uh, and uh, so really kind of contradictory messages uh, because we are speaking about internet. Uh, every article lives its, li uh, its life. Uh, uh, sometimes it's not uh, coherent uh, um, at all, the, the message. <laughs> and uh, the only stable me message, this is to be anti-EU. Uh, and uh, anti-West. As for um, uh, the future of Reset, I am optimistic as for long-term long perspective uh, for, because uh, every French president, except uh, probably um, François Hollande, uh, promises a certain strategic uh, relationship with Russia and he fails. It was the case of Nicolas Sarkozy. It's now forgotten, but Sarkozy um, promised a joint venture be between Russian electricity supplier and the French one. The problem is that Russia, I don't know, if you, if you follow uh, the propaganda and government messages, this is insane. Uh, of course, for France, uh, from French perspective, Russia, uh, it's on, on the same panel with China. Uh, and uh, even Sarkozy, he uh, re-established uh, uh, relationship with NATO, uh, not only with Putin. And the French uh, want to, to do in that perspective. But Russians want uh, loyalty. Uh, this is why uh, they will fail. Um, at one point. Uh, as for now, I'm more pes pessimistic as for Na Navalny poisoning, unfortunately. They had a reaction uh, only at the level of uh, uh, French Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs. For example, in UK, this is Boris Johnson himself who said it, it was outrageous. Um, I mm, had a chance to uh, also listen to some internal comments from people close uh, to Minister of, um, of the Army. Uh, it was not uh, for, uh, about Navalny, but it, is, it was about Skripal. And so the internal talk of um, L'Elysee, of uh, French uh, government, it was that we can understand uh, this Skripal was a traitor. Or, or so. so it was 
uh, really to to did the minimum. Uh, now with Navalny, all the conspiracy uh, theories uh, will uh, be proliferated, uh, not on, only on uh, Russia Today, but even in mainstream uh, French media, uh, we can see that he was not important. Then uh, we should investigate, of course, who uh, who is paying those articles, etc. I know that France uh, 24, they are they are hard. It's, it's a very good media, but uh, there are many others uh, who who don't uh, think uh, that this is um, so hard, to, uh, so important topic. Unfortunately, of Navalny's poisoning, uh, we should hope uh, on. Um, um, uh, the organization uh, on prohibition of chemical weapon, uh, weapons, right? So that uh, the bureaucracy will work. This, uh, but it should be even above France uh, at European level, uh, even uh, United Nations level. Michael. So, uh, and this one I open up to anyone who wants to answer it. So another um, hot topic at the moment, as a result of the Navalny poisoning, is. Okay, it's all well and good for Germany to come out and issue a you know forceful statement laying the blame at Russian state actors. However, you know whether Nord Stream two, right? This kind of lingering Ostpolitik mode of doing business between Berlin and and Moscow. Um, where do you see that headed? I mean, because clearly, you know, the energy sector has always been an arm of Russian foreign policy, going back to. The aughts, right? I mean, the, the the gas wars with Ukraine and so on and so forth. And you know, the cancellation of Nord Stream Two would seem to be a pretty aggressive approach by Berlin to say, "Okay, look, all bets are off now. Now you've tried to assassinate, you know, one of your own political actors, and we've had to clean up your mess by treating him in hospital here because you were covering up your own crime in Siberia." Anton, I mean, you follow German political affairs pretty closely. I mean, what do you, what do you think Merkel will do at this point? Um, well, uh, you know, they are, uh, they have started talking about the Nord Stream too. Uh, but I do believe that, um, they will not go as far as to cancel this project. I think that, uh, the Germans, uh, they have invested so much. Uh, not only in terms of, 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 you know, in terms of finances, but also politically, because the Germans have defended this project for several years already. When there are there there, there were voices coming from the Baltic states, from Poland, from Ukraine, uh, uh, the the Germans they 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 kept their line, and they are being supported by other by other European powers. Uh, who may not be the, too much vocal in 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 this defense of the of the project, but still they are there. For example, Sweden uh, recently said that uh, they stand uh, by their decision to grant uh, permission uh, for for the project. So it will all depend on. I think it will all depend on the talks between the Germans and the Russians, of which we will probably not really know. Um, I think that will be done behind closed doors, mm. and uh, truly, I well, I think that would be a natural step for the Germans. I mean, if they are so um, so strongly uh, criticizing the move to poison Navalny, that they would cancel the um, the project. But I, I don't think that it will be implemented. I don't think that they will um, uh, will do this. It may depend on on, on further actions uh, by by Moscow, and as we see, sometimes they're being very counterproductive, in, even in in terms of their own political interests. We uh, we have um, one question from an audience member, which I'd like yeah. to the first one actually. That's not a question for me. Um, how do you see global or EU, EU Magnitsky sanctions playing out as a result of the Navalny poisoning, and who should they go after? I leave it to anybody to answer that one. So the EU doesn't have Magnitsky sanctions yet. Um, they are still developing and Hungary was essentially trying to veto until very early this year when um, there were you know, negotiations that enabled Hungary to remove its veto. So we see EU human rights 
sanctions moving forward, but they don't exist yet. So you will see Magnitsky sanctions from the UK and from the US. Um, the EU will have to think about other strategies, um, other types of sanctions that it might use, and that will be tricky. Um, they may have to, you know, use, I don't know. It, I, yeah, I don't think you'll see human rights sanctions. So who should they go after? Um, that's a, you know, I think that there will be some intelligence identifying, um, you know, those officers that were involved and you may see, you know, some sanctions applied there. I don't think that you will see, you know, so many of the top um, intelligence officials and law enforcement officials in Russia are already sanctioned by the US um, that I, I don't know necessarily, I don't know, you know, mm. What more we're going to I see. wanted to add something because uh, uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, Vice President of uh, the Free Russia Foundation, Vladimir Karamurza, he was talking at the Bundestag. And as far as I understand, there is a move there, uh, 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 to introduce a Magnitsky Act in Germany. At least this move is registered now, so it will be discussed in the parliament. It, it is, a, I think, it, it is a good move, uh, should be welcomed. Again, the, the, the question is, of course, whether um, it will be supported by the, uh, by the main parties. Uh, in, in the German Bundestag, we have clearly pro-Kremlin parties, such as the Alternative for Germany and uh, Die Linke, or the left. Um, of course, they, they themselves cannot block um, this uh, move about the Magnitsky Act, but at the same time, there are... I would say some Putin fish there, you know, this Putin understanders among the the big parties as well, uh, mm. Merkel's party, uh, social uh, social democrats, in Greens in 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 the Green Party, not so many, but even in the Liberal Party, um, the 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 uh, f f uh, Free Democrats, they also have some Putin fish there, who may not be very supportive of of such a such a uh, act. Mm. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there because we ran about two minutes over time, but um, I do want to thank all of our presenters today for a uh, very enlightening and also sobering discussion, uh, Anton, Melissa, Anastasia. You can um, access the full um, report, Kremlin's Influence Quarterly, uh, Volume 2, I believe, at the Free Russia Foundation website, and don't forget to subscribe to Free Russia's um, mailing list to keep abreast of all the events and panel discussions that we have. One day, I hope we'll have them again in a brick and mortar building where we'll all be in the same place in the same time zone. But um, for now, Michael Weiss, and thanks very much for coming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for having me. Bye.